It's time to talk sports. It's Hacksaw's Headlines. A panorama of the world of sports. Stories, comments, and opinions. Touchdown, San Diego! Now, here's iconic sports talk show host Lee Hacksaw Hamilton and co-host John Riley. Who wants to talk football, college football? We do. Good afternoon, everyone. Happy New Year. This is Lee Hamilton along with my co-host, John Riley. We welcome you to bonus coverage, a special Monday podcast to talk about the college football playoffs, the college football season, the bowl games. Happy New Year, John. I don't know if we can top what we've just seen in college football in about the last 72 hours, but... Wow. Wow. I mean, it was usually these games kind of turn into duds, but both of the semifinals were edge of the seat the whole way through. Yeah, we're going to talk about a lot of different subjects as it relates to college football. Before we do, John, explain to all the people how our podcast works on the week and what we provide during the week, how they can subscribe, and then what we want them to do at the end of the podcast. We want the fans to come in and kind of co-host with us. Okay, so you know, we, we this is a bonus podcast, by the way. It's, we do this on, occasionally on Mondays. We've got a lot to talk about with the college playoffs. But every Thursday, we normally have our regular live stream at 3 p.m. You can uh, subscribe on the YouTube channel, Lee Hacksaw Hamilton. Click on the bell, get the updates, or subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Be sure to follow Lee on Twitter at, at Hacksaw1090 for a lot of updates. And you can get involved in the podcast, just like the old days on 690-1090. You can, you can call in. But in this case, you just got to type in your question or comment on Facebook or YouTube here in the live stream. We'll see it on the screen. We'll get you involved in the fans forum at the conclusion of Hacksaw's headlines. And I'll also invite you to join my website if you've never seen it. Take a look at it. It's really different. It's much like our very popular sports talk shows. It's all written. I write on it every day. LeeHacksawHamilton.com Question one, where do you want to start, John? Okay, we had a debate about what was going to happen with these two Big Ten teams. And boy, we, uh, we had different opinions last time. The big two from the big 10 are gone. How about that storyline? Now, I grant you, three of the four teams in the playoffs were really talented, really special. I was not sure about the fourth one, TCU. At the end of the day, Michigan has gone home, Ohio State has gone home, and who would have thought that? And at the end of the day, four teams putting up unbelievable statistics, throwing the football down the field, wearing out defenses, and attacking the record books. Do you know in the one playoff game, Michigan-Texas Christian, there were 1,015 yards total offense in that game? Wow. And then in the evening game, Georgia-Ohio State would have never expected that because they both play big boy defense. 1,000 yards on the money total defense, uh, wow. total offense from those schools. I mean, that was 2,000 yards of football in about an eight-hour span <laughs> in the semifinals of the championship playoffs. Just absolutely amazing. And I was really surprised by the outcome. How about you? Oh, I'm actually, I wanted Georgia and TCU. That's who I <laughs> predicted. So I wasn't surprised at all. I was having a great day. The look on Jim Harbaugh's face by the time they got to the finish line in that first game, it was like he ate a bad tuna fish sandwich. (laughs) And the look on the face of Ryan Day, Ohio State, when it ended the way it Mm -hmm, ended, and mm -hmm. they could not rally back, he looked devastated. And the late-breaking story on Monday afternoon in Columbus, Ryan Day is giving up all play calling. He's ceding the offense to one of his assistant coaches. Just because of what happened at this bowl game and what happened in the final regular season game, Ohio State was rocking and rolling towards what might have been a championship season and two back-to-back losses. That's a really bitter taste, bad tuna fish sandwich taste in your mouth. And Jim Harbaugh, the way this thing ended after they had rebuilt this program over a two-year span, Absolutely stunning. Okay, question number two. Let's move on. Talk about the games. Yeah, I mean, let's let's talk a little bit about this Frogs defense. I mean, they, they, this was what we were predicting going into this game. Texas Christian under Sonny Dykes has done just a fabulous job. They don't have what I would call a sexy offense, throw it down the field all the time. They pound it, and they got a very efficient quarterback. 
But what TCU does is they play defense, play defense, play defense, and then play more defense. Look at these stats from this game against Michigan, John, and then you tell me what describes Texas Christian. Uh, Two pick-six interception touchdowns by the Frogs' defense. Fourth down stop at the two. Fumble recovery at the one that they picked up in their own end zone. So that's that's four scoring drives that Ohio uh, that Michigan did not have because of the TCU defense. Third down, three for thirteen. Absolutely stunning what they did to Michigan on third down. Twelve tackles for loss. That's what Michigan was fighting all day. It was like wave after wave after wave of frog players on defense. I mean, that is a huge collective set of statistics for Texas Christian's defense. And then on top of that, you got the quarterback making plays, the running game, even though they lost Kedry Miller uh, with the ankle injury and the knee injury early, the running game piled up like 243 yards on the ground. I mean, that was a spectacular across-the-board performance by Texas Christian. But that defense, that was a signature of their calling card in that win. It's interesting that the defense was so great, yet there were still so many yards, so many points that were put on the board by Michigan. I mean, that's what makes these games so fun. It's like it's like a pinball machine with the ball going back and forth, up and down the field. Well, I, I, J.J. McCarthy put a ton of yards up at the end when it was all desperation. He threw for 343. And, you know, to lose after throwing for that many yards, that sticks – that's going to be a craw in your stomach for an entire off season, But Michigan could not run the football. I mean, Donovan Edwards had one or two good runs. He had a 58-yard run at the beginning of the game. That was it. That was the extent of really their big, big plays. And TCU just so big up front. I mean, we talked last week about how I respected the size and the bulk and the toughness and the grit and the determination of Michigan's defense. Texas Christian went up and down the field on him, and a quarterback kept making play. So TCU, just spectacular. Unsung heroes. Let's talk about the coach. Let's talk about the quarterback. Sonny Dykes' father was a longtime coach. He took this job a year ago. They were five and seven, and now he's got him in the national championship game. Max Duggan, quarterback, grew on the job. He became a complete quarterback. He can throw it down the field. He can run quarterback options. He can do the RPO package. He's got six foot four receivers. He's got two heavy duty running backs. That's quite a turnaround when you go from five and seven to the national championship game, snapping your fingers. And, you know, Duggan, I, uh, he wound up finishing second in the Heisman Trophy vote, which really stunned me because I have a vote and I did not consider him a top two. I didn't, in fact, I didn't put him in the top three. I had him fourth on my ballot. Uh, but, what a player. What a gamer. What a leader. What, I'll tell you what, in Fort Worth, what a weekend for Texas Christian. It has not been since 1938 that they were in a championship game for the national title. 1938, the quarterback was Davey O'Brien, whom they now name the quarterback award for the Davey O'Brien oh, oh, Award. Right on. Okay. He played at TCU. How cool is that for Duggan, Sonny Dykes, and that street tough defense to get to play in the championship game a week from Monday here in Los Angeles. Your reaction to what you saw when they had the ball? I mean, Duggan is a stud. I mean, I really like that kid. And I watched him in the Big 12 championship, and he was terrific. Um, but what, what the thing that I thought was interesting is they did a profile on television showing – the, the, the size and scope of TCU versus Michigan. Did you see that graphic? Mm-hmm. And TCU has like 12,000 students, and Michigan has what, like over 40,000? 51,000. 51,000. And they showed the, the campus acreage. And, I mean, it was just a David versus Goliath matchup. And it, it wasn't that long ago that TCU was in the Mountain West Conference. To see them rise up to this level, I think, is just a great story. Well, they were in the Mountain West, and they were, they were a tough Saturday in the Mountain West. And Gary Patterson did a great job. And then all of a sudden, a year ago, gone. Uh, you know, he, they had plateaued. They'd been really, really good. And they wound up in the Big 12 because of Gary Patterson's leadership. And then he was ousted. Uh, and then Sonny Dykes comes in. And Dykes, Dykes had been in the old Southwest Conference, and his dad coached it. And he had been at SMU and all that. And I thought, okay, they're just trying to— Try to tread water, and I don't know if TCU will ever be a player again. 
Yeah, well, there's another game to be played next Monday in the Frogs. The guys who were in purple are going to be in it. So what a, what a great job. Let's talk about the other game. Yeah, so we go from one quarterback and coach to the other one. Michigan, you know, we love Harbaugh. He, was, he, he played or he coached here at USD, but, but he had a rough go yesterday. They could not run the football. I mean, that, that's the thing that absolutely surprised me. And then they got mauled. I mean, they got stopped at the line of scrimmage. And that offensive line that had been moving people all year in the Big Ten Conference for those two big running backs, and there was no Blake Corum because of the knee scope surgery, and then Don Edwards disappeared, the, that offensive line got mugged. They got, nice word you use there, mauled. They got <laughs> mauled by, SM, or by a TCU's defensive front. And just, I, I thought Harbaugh was going to come apart mentally. He's, it was not his team on the field, the team that they had dominated. And I get one of the coaches made a comment that unless you've been in a ton of really close games, tight games, you don't know how your kids are going to react to the adversity. And they had not. Michigan had sledgehammered, steamrolled everybody all season long till they pretty much got to the end of the year. And even in the Ohio State game, they, they just blew the Buckeyes out. But Michigan just did not cope with everything that TCU did to them. And just to see that the look on the face of Harbaugh was like he was lost, like he was glazed. He didn't know how to handle it, what to do, how to react. He didn't show any emotion on the sideline. Uh, and, you know, I look at him and I, uh, I see flashbacks of Bo Schembechler. Well, I'll guarantee you Bo Schembechler wouldn't have been stoic on the sideline in the midst of all that adversity. So you never know how young, uh, how kids are going to respond when they had their first chunk of adversity, and this was really their first chunk of adversity, and boy, did they get it handed to them in the game. Yeah, it was it was a rough go. He was he was stunned, but now I'm hearing these rumors that he might go to the NFL. What do you think about that? Well, the Denver Broncos have asked uh, the people in Ann Arbor for permission to talk to him. The players have gone public and said he's a Michigan man. He's not going to leave. He should not leave. Better not leave. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. Harbaugh, he's done a great job there. He's done a great job everywhere he's been, but he does worry out with the way he does his job. Uh, I'll be intrigued to see if he wants to go back into the National Football League. I think not. He's he's a Michigan man. He looks like Bo Schembechler, acts like Bo Schembechler. <laughs> he's had Bo Schembechler's success. Why would he leave? Okay, turn the page. Let's go to the next question here as we're talking about the college football playoffs. Yeah, and let's talk about these guys from Georgia. Boy, they were the number one going in, and they, they closed it out. They did, and they know how to play tough games and they know how to come from behind and they were down 14 points twice in that game Kirby Smart historically has always had great defenses at the University of Georgia but the guy on the other side there that quarterback Stetson Bennett that is quite a story this was a walk-on this was a Juco kid who came back to Athens Georgia this is a kid that's when he came back was like third on the depth chart and he wound up being the starter other guys played poorly. Other guys got hurt. And he, he led them or managed them a year ago to get to the championship game. He got them to the championship game this year by his boldness down the field, him throwing the football. And, you know, if Kirby Smart was to give you a card with his name and address and phone number and email, it, uh, it, on that card it would say defense. What won them the game? Their offense. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was – you're talking about out of character? Holy cow, this was so surprising. And I will say this, Bennett Bennett had no fear. He stayed in the pocket. He made passes at crunch time. He went down the field in attack mode. He threw for 398, I think it was, and a ton of touchdowns. And that's totally out of character for him because he's a quarterback, John, that would just manage the game. He'd throw short passes and they'd hand it off to the – Macintoshes of the world and the whole group of running backs that they have, and they just they just ball, and then defensively they just kick your butt. Well, that was that was quite a performance by Stetson Bennett in that victory. Yeah, I mean, I really enjoyed watching him play, and and to your point, this this the backstory, the walk on at Georgia doesn't really get any reps the first year, goes to JUCO, and then gets the scholarship to come back to be a backup. And I guess that was during the whole Justin Fields when he transferred to Ohio State. Mm -hmm. So there was a little bit of you know 
flow between those two teams. But you got to give it up for this kid because they won the championship last season, and now they might win it again. Bennett threw for 398 and three touchdowns in that win, 398. He'd go three weeks where he wouldn't throw for 398 collectively (laughs) during the SEC season. Uh, But I, I think it also proves the point. Kirby Smart, Georgia, and the conference they play in, there are a lot of tough games on that schedule you play in. And there are a bunch of games that kind of go down to the crunch at the end. So tremendous win by Georgia. And what an awful finish at Ohio State. Uh, We knew this would be a tough matchup. Uh, C.J. Stroud uh, put a lot of numbers on the board. Threw for 348 uh, and four touchdowns, and they lost the game. But at the end of the day, the Buckeyes defensively were poor again, just like they were the final Saturday in November when they were poor and they got smoked by Michigan. Uh, in, in defense of C.J. Stroud, he lost his top wide receiver, Marvin Harrison, second quarter with a concussion. Harrison had three big catches right at the start of the game. Running game, two of the three backs had surgeries. It just wasn't the same ground game anymore. But the defense never got better, not not from the the game against Michigan and obviously not in this game. And like I said, there were 1,000 yards total offense uh, between these two teams. And, boy, you look at Ryan Day, and he just looked like a lost soul on the sideline. He could not believe it was happening uh, to his team again. And you know, the Buckeyes the Buckeyes collapsed just, just like they collapsed like a cheap beach chair in the game <laughs> against the University of Michigan. So they got a long offseason ahead. They're going to have to re- reevaluate coaches on the defensive staff. They're going to have to reevaluate their system uh, because, it, to me, shocking. Now, I got friends in Columbus and – Cleveland and Akron that I've emailed and texted back and forth with, and they're just, they're stunned. Two losses in a row at the end of the season. This is Ohio State. Two losses in a row at the end of the mm-hmm. season. Bad losses, losses in which you had the lead, you let it get away. Yeah, I mean, I think Ohio State football is the number one sports program in the entire state of Ohio, isn't it? Yes. Um, so, yeah, for this has got to be a crushing defeat for all the fans. But it is interesting to me that he's given up the offensive play calling duties for next season. I mean, that is a lot to you know manage during the game when you're trying to be the overall leader and kind of get into the X and O's of the offense in the moment. Um, you, maybe you need to delegate and maybe be able to perform better as a head coach. Okay, I'm not going to put you on the spot, but who do you think is going to win a week from Monday when Georgia <laughs> plays Texas Christian? Are you wearing purple or are you wearing bulldog red? I'm wearing purple. I'm going all TCU, baby. This is going to be good. I'll vote for the dog, too. That, that'd that be kind of cool. What a way mm-hmm. to finish up. Okay, before we go into some other topics, we get to halftime here. we got some other college football topics that we're going to talk about. John, uh, explain again how the fans who enjoy what we're doing on our Thursday weekly podcast can get access and get alerts to when we post stuff as we do virtually every day now. Yeah, so if you subscribe on the YouTube channel for Lee Hacksaw Hamilton and click on that bell, you'll get notifications when we have new updates on the channel. You know, we do the live stream every Thursday at 3. We do these bonus podcast live streams on Mondays from time to time, but we also take these podcast episodes, particularly the Thursday ones, and chop them up into little three to four minute bite sized pieces and spread the love throughout the week. And you can get updates on those when you subscribe to the channel. And I'll tell you what, Lee, those those clips on YouTube are just been blowing up throughout the month of December. It's been unbelievable. OK, and also invite you. Please check out my website. If you liked our sports talk show back in the day, the way we did it with all the information, you'll like the website. It's Lee Hacksaw Hamilton dot com. I write on it every day. You get the best 15 minutes in sports. You get Hacksaw's headlines. I write a one man's opinion column. So check that out on a day by day basis. I think you'll really get a kick out of it. Okay, topics on the table. Let's move on to the next question. Okay, so I remember back in the day, New Year's Day used to be the Rose Bowl, the Cotton Bowl, the Orange Bowl, and the Sugar Bowl, right? And now everything's upside down. So, and some of these bowls are no longer in the driver's seat. It, it, it's taken a little bit of the luster, a little bit of the electricity. Uh, and I think the point you're leading me to is the way that question is posed. Have the college playoffs made all the other bowls an afterthought? And I kind of think they have, sadly. It's not to say that there's not good games. You know, the Rose Bowl, Penn State, Utah, that's big boy football. That's that's a game worth 
paying attention to. The Cotton Bowl was just a spectacular finish of all things Tulane. Tulane? Really? (laughs) Tulane beat USC with two touchdowns in the final three minutes. What a shocker there. But these bowls, the marquee bowls, are just no longer front and center. And there's, I think there's just a bit, of, a bit of an emotional loss or a prestige loss because of the way the championship bowls have kind of taken over everything. Now, when they expand a year from now and when they actually go to a 12-team playoff, and we'll talk about that in a second, these bowls are going to be part of the rotation. But it's not, it's not what it was before. I used to, and everybody would get excited about Big Ten champion. Pac-10 or Pac-12 champion. That's pretty cool. We know the history. Well, it's it's now different. And sadly, a chunk of the big bowls have kind of become an afterthought. Yeah, I think um, it's change is hard, right? I mean, we've gone. We're now in this college football playoff system, which I prefer. Because how many times did we get the champion of the Rose Bowl was undefeated, the champion of the Sugar Bowl was undefeated, and it was this mythical championship? You couldn't prove who the winner was, so they have to go to the playoffs. Yeah, that means the Rose Bowl maybe is in a rotation. Sometimes there are semifinals, sometimes not. It's tough. There's a lot of tradition, and I think people, uh, the you know, old school school folks are just adapting to the change. Well, we're going to 12 a year from now, and I've got opinions about that. John's got opinions about that. But unfortunately, and maybe you just have to be flexible, things do change. Mm -hmm. But like you say, those four big bowl games on New Year's Day, they were always special. Always. New Year's Day this weekend, we were watching the NFL on New Year's Day. There were no bowl games at all. Right. So, so, And we've got a bunch of games, obviously, on Monday that are spillover from what New Year's Day mm-hmm. used to be. So it is a, a different time. I, I think, sadly, the marquee bowls have kind of become an afterthought. Next question about the rest of the bowls. So when I remember as a kid, the, the four marquee bowls, Rose, Orange, Sugar, and Cotton, were on New Year's Day. But the next best one after that was always the Holiday Bowl. And now the Holiday Bowl is back in San Diego, back at Petco. And what a game. Yeah, Oregon, North Carolina was a shootout. But I I think it begs the question, 42 bowl games, are they too many? When you have to start searching and looking, is there a 6-6 and or a 6-7 and team we can take? Because we got bowl slots, so we got to fill for all these much lower level tier bowls. I'm not talking about the holiday bowl, but the smaller ones. Is that good? Well, I'll give you two perspectives. A, I don't think it's good when you're playing a, quote, bowl game in front of 15,000 fans, which a bunch of these smaller bowls draw. Uh, San Diego State played in the Hawaii Bowl in a smaller stadium and had 9,000 fans. Is mm-hmm. that a, is that a really bowl game as we know bowl games used to be? That's an issue. However, I will tell you, if you've not been to a bowl game in a long period of time and you get the chance to go to a bowl game and you have these festivities and your kids get to travel and play in the sunshine. I mean, my alma mater, Ohio U, played Wyoming right down to the final second in the Arizona Barstool Bowl and beat them. Right on. That's cool for the kids. It's a cool trip. The people that live in the snow and cold of Athens, Ohio, came to Tucson and saw the sun and saw the cactus and had a good time, and they'll remember that forever. And I think also when you're at a, a smaller Division I program in one of these smaller conferences, whether it's the Mountain West, whether it's the Mid-American, etc., and you start looking and you hear names like the Bahamas Bowl. How cool is that to go to the Bahamas in December? Miami of Ohio went. Hmm. You know, and you think Aloha Hawaii Bowl. That sounds pretty sexy from San Diego State's perspective or anybody else. Going to Hawaii might be a once-in-a-lifetime trip for a whole bunch of these kids. So when, when you see all these other unique environment bowl games, you say, yeah, it's cool. The players get to go. They play another game. They probably take part in festivities they'd never, ever take part in again in, in their life. So I, I think there's a place for all these bowl games. The Holiday Bowl puts on a tremendous show for these kids. And the Holiday Bowl is our Chamber of Commerce postcard for the rest of the nation. I wrote a column about, hey, Buffalo, 
44 inches of snow. Turn on your TV tonight because I know you're not going out. Here's the Holiday Bowl. You get to see the palm trees and the sunshine, and you get to see footballs flying all over the place. And we have such a great reputation in our community for an electrifying bowl game year in, year out. And Oregon, North Carolina did not let us down. But I, I think the sexiness of the Myrtle Beach Bowl and some of these other bowl games, the Citrus Bowl, that's kind of cool, I guess. So 42 bowls might be awful, awful hey, high, but for these kids, it's a memory of a lifetime. And for the programs, it's good. Yeah, I, I like it. I mean, because it's a lot of this is made for TV, even if there's only 9,000 people in the stands. I remember as a kid, I was up in the Bay Area and back in the day in the 70s. There were only, what, maybe 12 bowl games, yes. something like that. And Stanford and Cal never got into a game. And then one year, Stanford got into the Blue Bonnet Bowl. And like I was thrilled as like an 11 or 12 year old kid that they made the bowls. So that was it's good for the local community, good for the students. It is weird when the players, you know, or the teams are like around five. But, you know, so what? It's the holiday season. Just have fun and go with it. And then we know where the premier bowls are. We know where the top teams are playing. Well, the kids from Syracuse, they got to go to Yankee Stadium to play in the pinstripe bowl. And the kids from the Midwest who went to play the Fenway Bowl, where the Red Sox play at Fenway Park. Nice. That's kind of a cool experience. Okay, next question about the bowl games, the NCAA, and where we're going from here. Okay, so you you were talking a little bit about this. They're talking about this 12-team format, opening up the bracket. Let's, Let's go there. Okay, here's the big argument. 12 teams. We got all these good college football teams. And everybody was whining when it was originally just two that played in the championship. You're leaving out all these other good teams. So now we go to four. And there's barking and bitching about, well, the fifth and sixth teams are pretty good. How come Alabama's not part of this final four? Mm -hmm. So now we're going to 12. The only concern I have about the 12-team playoff is, okay, you're going to take the conference champions. You're going to take the top-ranked teams that are not conference champions. They'll get consideration. We are going to guarantee the Mountain West and the Conference USA's of the world, their champion can be part of this playoff. But is there too much danger of bringing in 12 teams and teams 9, 10, 11, and 12 probably can't match up with the top group? And is it really good to have a 63-7 to playoff game? You know, And I know the other argument on the other street corner, John, is – March Madness, yeah. NCAA, mm-hmm. Virginia Commonwealth can knock somebody out in their first game on that first Thursday. So, you know, does an 18 seed beat a one? Yeah, once in a while. But would we get too many blowouts if if we've got the Georges of the world playing an unbeaten Boise State team or a San Diego State team and then battering them? Is that good? a good thing? Well, I mean, maybe it's going to be like Tulane and SC, you know, where the underdog wins or like a wild card team in the NFL playoffs that goes and wins the Super Bowl. So I I think it's great. I I, I mean, I I would open it up to 16 if it was up to me. Yeah. And then and then you give all these other bowl games the opportunity to be a quarter finalist game and and kind of spread that around. So I say the more the merrier. You're a football junkie. You just want to watch football every day of the week, regardless of who's on, <laughs> yeah. what the score is, et cetera, et yeah. cetera. But I will say the the bowl season this year, more than recent years, there have been so many spectacular last-minute bowl victories. It's just been absolutely amazing. Okay, let's talk about the college football landscape and where the game is going. Uh, I'll ask the question, plain and simple. The first day the transfer portal open for next season – First day was December 3rd. We had over 1,000 players enter their name the first day. There were 3,200 there by the end of the first week. The transfer portal has become like free agency. And coaches use it because coaches got to fill holes on rosters. And coaches got to win games and keep their jobs and, and keep the alumni happy and sell tickets and jerseys and all that. But, boy, the free agency to me has just taken something off it because not only is a coach like Brady Hoke got to recruit at at a a group of five school, not a power five, but a group of five. Not only has he got to recruit unique kids to come here to play at San Diego State, then it's like he's got to re-recruit his own kids at the end of each calendar year to stay rather than go. And it's happening all around the country. And it's really happening at the quarterback position. 
I mean, they've been, I think I kept track. I want to say there have been 18 starting quarterbacks who have left schools. The starters have left schools to jump into the transfer portal and gone other places. We have kids now that have been at four schools in four years Wow! to play. Now, that, that to me is absurd because last I checked, the goal is not only to play football, but to get your college degree and graduate and have a future. Mm-hmm. And these guys are just going. And then you got that, and then you got the NIL payments. And there's a financial bidding war that's going on with all these kids. Part of me, that, that, that's out of control, and the NCAA refused to do anything to control it. There will be a new president taking over. Uh, the former mayor of, of, of the city of Boston is taking over as the head of the NCAA in place of the retiring Mark Emmert. Emmert's parting gift was a transfer portal in the NIL. And I don't think either one of those things is really good for college football. Now, I'm not going to get into the argument about amateurism versus professionalism and who is making all the money the university was off the backs of all these kids that are going to school. But I, I just think it's, it's, it's had a huge negative impact in the operation of college football programs. Yeah, I mean, it makes it a lot harder. Uh, like, think about what Brian Dutcher has had to do with the basketball program at the Aztecs. He's always looking for transfers and looking for four-year players, and he's been able to find a nice balance. But now when you expand that to how many players are on a college football roster, it's like over 100, right? Yes. I mean, so how do you manage that? It's got to be really hard. The world is changing, you know, and so now the coaches have to shift with it. But I'll bet you the bet you this. Well, how many are in the portal now? Three thousand. I bet you two thirds of them want to go play for Coach Prime in Boulder. <laughs> <laughs> well, he got uh, he's recruited very well. But Jackson State, they're not real happy because he took seven coaches and 22 Jackson State players entered the portal. And I think five of them so far have wound up at Colorado. But, uh, you know, you know, college football was recruit you, will develop you as a player, you work towards your degree, it's your alma mater. And these kids are coming and going. Like I say, these quarterbacks spend four schools in four years. Yeah, that, that's, that's nuts. That's absolutely <laughs> yeah. uh, over the top. So I'll be interested to see what, what the new president of the NCAA can do in terms of the structure of the transfer portal and what they can do to actually control the situation uh, about the NIL and the amount of money that, that some of these players are getting. Okay, final question. Uh, we, we've kind of answered the questions about the new leadership of the NCAA and what, what has to happen. Uh, I'll, I'll be intrigued to see what the structure of the payment plan works out. I found it unbelievably offensive. I'll give you a prime example of why the NIL is so out of control. University of Kentucky has gotten all these blue ribbon basketball players every year, all these McDonald All American five stars. And one of their players got involved at Kentucky. And it was kind of a bidding situation. Well, am I, where am I going to go? And that I hear there. On, and he decided to go to Kentucky. And then he didn't get eligible. And he, so he sat that year and he opted out to go to the NBA. And he wound up being a late first round draft pick. And his parting farewell to the people of the University of Kentucky was thanks for the wheels. Oh, I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. He got, that was his <laughs> NIL gift from right. big cigars from the alums. Right. Thanks for the wheels. Not the opportunity to go get a degree or play at UK for Calipari, but thanks for the wheels. And that to me is just a bad prime example of what college athletics has become because of the NIL and the fact the NCAA would not handle the NIL. Yeah. So, I mean, that was an extreme case because that guy didn't play at all. And so he didn't really even earn the NL money or the wheels that he got. But you look at here locally with San Diego State and you know they, they have a unique program, this Mesa Foundation, where they get the kids involved in these, um, uh, you know, kind of charitable philanthropic events and they kind of spread the money somewhat equally. So it's not a have and have not situation. And now these kids, you know, you're not going to have like who was the kid that played for um, uh Connecticut that was like starving. Remember, he couldn't like mm-hmm. pay for his meals. He went on to the NBA and had a great run. These kids now, they can at least have some walking around money. And I think that's a good thing. Well, we'll see where it goes. There will be some structural change in the NCAA with the new incoming president. Okay, now it's a fan's chance to stand up and sound off and make some statements or ask some questions or get yelled at or <laughs> get called out or whatever. Here comes our popular fans forum. Where do you want to start, John? Okay, we got actually got a lot of people here jumping on board. And uh, this first question is from Bob Lowe. It says, when will Snapdragon get the Holiday Bowl or restart the point? 
poinsettia. Well, I don't think the poinsettia is coming back because I think the economics are so negative right now to be able to do anything more creative. I think the Holiday Bowl, they've got the short-term contract at Petco. Uh, but remember, Snapdragon is only 35000 You know, Holiday Bowl was forty. I think they could jam 44000 in there. So I think economics come to play a part of it. But there's no doubt that Snapdragon is going to be a player for events. Now, they've, they've got off-road events with the monster trucks coming. Right. It used to be down at Petco Park. Mm-hmm. Um, the the in, intriguing thing is Jerry Jones, the owner of the Dallas Cowboys, has a side business called Legends. And they have contracts all around the country with different stadiums and venues. They put on concerts. They sell tickets. They do marketing. Um, I think that Legends is part and parcel of Snapdragon's operation. And the Jerry Jones-led side business is going to come in here and compete for events that Petco Park used to get on their own. So that's that's why we got this off-road thing monster trucks coming to Snapdragon uh, in in the month of January. Uh, But I don't know that, well, they'll move from Petco Park yet, although everything I was told, it was just a really, really great experience, as weird as it looked uh, to see a football field in a baseball stadium. Yeah, well, you know, Petco does that golf thing where they they could tee off from the third deck and and they're going to have a lot more concerts. So there's Mm -hmm. just a lot more entertainment that's going on. And it's great that San Diego has another marquee venue. Yeah, exactly. Venue is the correct term. Next question here on our fans forum. Okay, this is from Ryan Kennedy. Bennett thought Georgia was screwed towards the end, but Ohio State had a wide left field goal attempt that even missed the net. Yeah, it was really odd with the time they had and the chance to kick that field goal, though it was from 50. Uh, I I didn't think the kicker was set. I think the snap snap was clean, but uh, the kicker seemed to be rocking, and uh, there's just some mechanics to kicking a field goal that I did not see. Like, the whole thing was rushed, and I mean, he... He mishit that thing, and that, that, that thing never got to the crossbar, much less be on line. But, boy, how many kicks have we seen rocket off the uprights that either <laughs> bing, went in for a game-winning kick, field goal, or a point after, or bing, ricocheted out and cost the team the game. So kickers play a key part of the game. But the bowl season has just been electric for how many end-of-game end of plays who have had the side of the games. Well, think about the pressure on that young man, you know, to, to put his team into the national championship on a long field goal. And then he has a history where I think where his grandfather was a longtime season ticket mm-hmm. holder at Ohio State. He played in North Carolina, was able to transfer to the Buckeyes. He all of this weight on his shoulder. And then he just kind of forced it and it shanked it. It's kind of a shame. But uh, yeah, I mean, it was something. So let's move on here. We've got another one here from uh, Ryan Kennedy. He says, once the BCS came around in the late 90s, it certainly made these once prestigious bowls and other bowls pointless. Yeah, the, the you're correct, Ryan. The, the electricity and the energy of a lot of these other bowl games has kind of gone down a notch or two. Not to say that you can't have a good game. Just ask everybody in New Orleans right now how they feel about the Tulane Green Wave and what they did to USC at the end. But it's just, it's not the same thing. TV, TV money, TV contracts are now driving everything in college athletics. And I guess that's good for the schools, that these schools can get $51 million a year in the Big Ten in revenue sharing because of the media contracts. And the SEC is $61 million per year to every school, whether you're really good uh, like Alabama or you're really bad like Vanderbilt. Because that money helps fund the other 18 or 20 or 21 intercollegiate athletic programs uh, that you have to have. But to me, there's there's loss of specialness. But like I said in our earlier comments, if you're from Coastal Carolina and you're getting a chance to go play in the Bahamas Bowl against Miami of Ohio, what a cool trip for the kids and a memory of a lifetime. So I think there's there's lots of positives. There are some glitches, though, the way the thing has, comes out. I wonder, there are some teams, though, that it's a net financial loss for them to go to the game, right? That the payoff that they get is less than all the travel expenses. Well, San Diego State doesn't travel very many people anywhere. Mm-hmm. You know, and you know, they've and they've been to a whole wide variety of games from the Frisco Bowl in Texas to the Potato Bowl, and obviously in Honolulu. I just don't think they sell a lot of tickets, which is too bad. But the big schools, oh yeah, Cotton Bowl. How many people were wearing Cardinal and Gold at the Cotton Bowl in Dallas? It was absolutely amazing how many there were. Yeah, the and, alumni flock there from all over the country. And the Rose Bowl. 
the color of the day was red. Utah Utes red, with the exception of one big section, which was all Penn State white and blue. Wow. But uh, the big schools, their fans, they got a lot of alums. They do travel. They do travel. All right, let's move on here. Ryan has another comment. The Holiday Bowl seemed like it was always had the high power offense at BYU in the late 80s and early 90s. Well, that's when I first got uh, attracted to the Holiday Bowl. Uh, I told the story a week ago. I was living on Long Island, growing up on Long Island. It was snowy and nine degrees on Long Island. And I flipped on the TV, and there I saw palm trees, and I saw footballs, and I saw sunshine. I said, wow, Holiday Bowl. Never thinking I get the chance to broadcast a bowl. When I was the voice of the Arizona State Sun Devils, we played Arkansas out here. It was a defensive struggle. It was not a (laughs) 51-50 game. But I'll tell you what, thanks to Lavelle Edwards and all the great assembly line quarterbacks that came out of BYU, they put this bowl game on the map. BYU-Michigan, BYU-SMU. I mean, just some spectacular games along the way. So Holiday Bowl's got great tradition. Uh, I I hated to have UCLA did the bowl what they did a year ago when they canceled out five hours beforehand uh, after never having been honest about what was going on within their program in the year prior, obviously, with COVID. But playing downtown on the Gaslamp Quarter, quote, a good time was had by all. Oh, yeah, you know it. You know it. (laughs) All right, let's move on down the list here. We got uh, from Ed McShane, The Voice. That is I, guilty as charged. I am here. <laughs> now, we've had, uh, it's a great time. I, I, I run into the people all the time that just recall spectacular stuff about the years with as the voice of the San Diego Chargers and funny stories and incidents and, and things like that. And a lot of guys who recall the specialness of what uh, our original radio station, Extra Sports 690, was. And then when we recreated it, the Mighty 1090, uh, before co- corporate ownership kind of wrecked it. Um, but so it's nice to be remembered. But, boy, it's it's cool to have people now getting back to you and say, hey, we really enjoy what you're doing on this this podcast. And they, they let go. Guy stop me at the fitness center. And he said, I watch your podcast. It's pretty good. Do you really have a Royal Manual typewriter still in your garage? <laughs> I said, yeah, the key's broken. Couldn't get it fixed, so I had to go to electric. And now, obviously, I, I dabble on computers like the whole world does. So, yeah, it's nice to be remembered. Thank you. Okay, so uh, Ryan Kenny says, how many MLB stadiums host a bowl game? It's quite a few. Major League Baseball stadiums? Yeah. Well, Yankee Stadium, Fenway Park. I don't know of any others. Petco. Well, okay, that's three. Okay, that's, that's cool, uh, but they're all football stadiums, football venues, NFL venues. I think, uh, for the most part. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and Ryan goes, yeah, it's quite a few MLB venues. Uh, moving along these days, if a team is five hundred, they automatically get in a bowl. It diminishes the bowl concept. He didn't like the blue bonnet bowl you were no, talking he, about. He didn't like that back one. in the day, but. Uh, yeah. We've talked extensively about 42 bowl games, but how cool it is for a trip when these kids uh, get the chance to have a, a chance to go to the Bahamas Bowl. You ever going back to the Bahamas again? Probably not. Probably not. That, yeah, cool. for a lot of these kids, they haven't traveled much at all. So yeah. good for them. Um, David Andrews says, hey, let, hey, Lee, let's get Bill Wendell on your show. We'll have to work on that. Billy's in Philadelphia. He's doing very well. He's got a, a small sports talk show he does daily uh, at a small station outside Philadelphia. And I'm, I go on it every once in a while, maybe once a month to just talk sports. And Billy's Billy. He hasn't changed. <laughs> you talk, do, you, do you know my good friend, Philly Billy Wendell, is the only man I know that does not own a laptop, does not have an email address? Really? Really? Yes. I give him grief about that all the time. Uh, his life stopped in terms of technology in 1988. In fact, I always razzed him. I said, you still got a black and white TV, too? But uh, great guy, great friend, long time, long time accomplice. Our Lads Draft Guide, right? That's right. Back yeah. in the day. And he still does stuff for Our Lads Draft Guide. All right, one more. Hit me with one more here. Okay, so Ryan says, I don't have a problem with the transfer portal, especially if the head coach that recruited him has left the program. Well, it's a big argument, huge argument about my coach who recruited me has taken a better job. Why should I not be allowed to to go outside? And that, that was actually one of the trigger points for the transfer portal. Coaches get fired or coaches leave, kids get left behind. And then, you know, the other part of the equation was the NIL, that the players – 
Players make all this money for their universities, tickets, TV contracts, game jerseys, and the players were not getting any financial remuneration for what they were doing. Yes, they got a college scholarship, but as you say, these kids from the inner city don't have 25 cents to buy a hamburger. Mm -hmm. So that's why the, the student rights lawsuits began, and that, that's why we wound up eventually— it started with stipends. Every student athlete would get a, a financial stipend. To the point now, it's exploded to the NIL. But they have to they have to rein it in. They have to box it so that everybody's operating by the same set of rules. Because it's not fair in in the Big Twelve if Texas A and M's got all these rich oil alumni that are pouring tons of money mm -hmm. into the NIL box. But somebody like Iowa State in the conference, which has a limited alumni following or history, tradition, can't keep up with them financially. So that's what the new president of the NCAA, Ed Baker, uh, from Boston, who's replaced Mark Emmert, uh, just took office today, uh, January 2nd. Uh, that That's what's going to happen. Hey, listen, we really appreciate you being part of our bonus coverage. We invite you to subscribe so you'll get alerts when we do our regular Thursday podcast and all the bonus coverage we provide. For John O'Reilly, this is Lee Hamilton. Happy New Year. Thanks for being with us. We'll talk to you on Thursday as our podcasts continue. Nice to have you with us. Join us again for Hacksaw's Headlines on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. And find the audio version on your favorite podcast app. For more content, go to LeeHacksawHamilton.com.